All right. We'll turn back to John chapter 3 uh, just to kind of catch up. Um, there are basically, and uh, Melinda and I were talking about this coming down the, uh, the road, there's a couple of conversations that kind of go on between John chapter 3 and John chapter 4. First of all, you have this conversation of uh, Nicodemus, a very deep conversation, a lot, uh, a lot is there. And then we have this statement that everyone knows in John chapter 3 and verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Remember, the thought does not end there. It continues on. Verse 17, For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but the world might be saved through him. He who believes him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than light for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. And we talked about that uh, that statement in there is probably John narrating some of the things that were just spoken about with Nicodemus and being born again into the kingdom. It's not something that, you know, the kingdom is not something, the kingdom of God, what they were looking for was because of their heritage of being a Jew. And Jesus says, no, you have to be born again into the kingdom. It's something completely different than what you're looking for. So there's a lot uh, there in John chapter 3. Um, and then we see that after these things, Jesus' disciples came into the land of Judea. We uh, read a lot about John the Baptist and some of the things that he made a statement about with John. And all of these people who uh, knew John the Baptist, what did they think of John the Baptist? To someone great. He's someone great, a prophet. You know, they didn't really know how to say, is he Elijah? You know, who is he? And... Um, but John says, no, I am not the one that you are seeking. And then he makes this uh, statement in verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. And so John understands that his role in uh, the scheme of redemption is now starting to, you know, the curtains are being drawn on his part of the play. And now we see that Jesus must kind of come into the picture because just remember what John was he was simply a, he was to pave the road. He was to make, uh, make it uh, known or easier for uh, Jesus. And we see this whole section here is about uh, his discussion on, on part of who John was. Uh, specifically, uh, the question comes up about the purification in verse 25. Uh, and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he is with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified. Behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. So we got a problem here. And John says, no, we don't have a problem. He's doing what he's supposed to do. Um, and I am decreasing while he is increasing. With that in mind, let's continue on in chapter 4 because the, uh, the very first word of chapter 4 is what? Therefore. Therefore. What does therefore mean when you read it? More. Do what? More. More. More of it. Because of what I just talked about, therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself was not baptizing, but the disciples were, he left Judea and went away again into Galilee. So because Jesus had heard that the Pharisees knew that he was baptizing more, there could have been controversy. So or more questions and stuff like that. And we see this discussion that he had with one of the Pharisees, and that being Nicodemus. But because he heard you know, that they knew, he starts to go into Judea and went away again into Galilee. Now notice the word again. So where is he going back to? Galilee, specifically around that area of Canaan. We'll see that uh, shortly. And he had to pass through Samaria. Is that a good place to be passing through if you were a Jew? No, we don't want anything to do with Samaritans. Now, who were the Samaritans? Half Jew, half Gentile. Half Jew, half Gentile. And they also had what? A separate way of thinking about who, what? About the Jews. Well, they, they thought differently of the Jews and what the Jews did, obviously. 
Um, but they also had a different way of thinking about God and the Christ. And so we'll, and, the, and the worship was different also. So of course that's going to be abhorrent to a Jew because you're following a false religion, you're doing the wrong things, and of course that's going to uh, uh, make it to where the Jews are not going to have any kind of conversation with them. Uh, so they're passing through Samaria, and he comes to a city uh, of Samaria called Sychet, uh near the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. And Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, being wearied from his journey, was sitting thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. Now the first question I have was this, and this is more of a personal question for you. When was the last time you were nice to someone you didn't have to be? Now, that's something that you have to answer, but an example of that, and, uh, you know, and I've often said this before, um, you know, the little things that you do make a huge impact on people's lives. Here's an example. Whenever I was first kind of emerging as I want to try to get into management, you know, and all this kind of stuff, well, there just so happens to be uh, a manager who was there, and he said, you know, let me make a phone call, and we'll see if we can kind of get you on the rolls. Now, to him... It was just a phone call. But to me, it started to change things in my outlook of my career and then ultimately the outlook that I have for um, my family and everything else that, that kind of comes along with those benefits of kind of moving up the ladder. Now, again, to him, it's just a phone call. We just make a phone call. But to me, I'm like, I can't believe he's doing this for me. So, you know, that's kind of the example that, you know, we, we uh, need to understand is those little things that we do in life actually have a huge impact. This conversation that's about to happen has a huge impact, not just in this uh, woman's life, but in the life of the entire city, as we'll see um, here very shortly. So he had to pass through Samaria. He comes to this, um, to this city. Uh, we see that Jacob's well is there. He's tired, so he sits down, and he is going to get a drink of water. And it says it was about the sixth hour. Now, most people went up to the well kind of early in the morning to go ahead and get that, uh, that taken care of because it was uh, cooler uh, during that time. Uh, what time did this woman go to the well, and why do you think she went at that time? Because we talk about whenever, um, whenever um, Nicodemus comes to him, and it was at night, so there has to be something there. So now John says squarely that it's about the sixth hour, and he's writing that in there for a, for a specific reason. So why do you think she's coming there then? Go ahead, Glenn. It's, it's about noon. And it, from what I can gather from some of the context, like you said, most people go in the morning, so it seems she's avoiding a crowd. Mm -hmm. Jesus says, you have five husbands. That may mean that she has a pretty bad reputation amongst the society there. So. With those two things kind of coupling together, you kind of can see where she would want to avoid you know, uh, certain people, or you know, altogether just go at a different time, even though it's you know the hottest part of the day kind of the situation, so that she doesn't have to deal with society. Yeah, or you know maybe there's less cattle there. We don't really know, but we can, as you said, as you look in context of the conversation, specifically about the five uh, husbands. You know, she probably does have kind of a, a stain on her that um, she's wanting to kind of hide and just kind of stay away from the crowd. She doesn't really want to hear uh, the jeering that maybe the, the crowd will give her um, or the, the sneers or the, you know, whatever it is that uh, she's doing it. So this, that's going to be rectified. I mean, we're going to see that um, Jesus kind of calls that out and we'll also see um, her reaction uh, to this. All right, so in verse 7, Jesus asked her for some water. And there came a woman of Samaria to draw uh, water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. And so, again, a very simple thing that, that happens here. And, um, and then it says in verse, uh, verse 8, where were the disciples? They were going into town to buy food. And they went into town to buy food because Jesus was tired. They're probably tired. Um, and they're going to go get some sustenance uh, so they can continue on in their journey. Uh, but in verse 7, Jesus asked the woman for some water. In verse 9, 
John gives us a reason why there was why it was such an unusual request that Jesus would even ask this. And what is that reason? They were as the Samaritan people were unclean to the Jewish nation and evidently they shunned them and didn't have anything to do with them and lived apart from them. They did live apart from them. And we also see her reaction or her question uh, in verse 9 is, how is it that you, being a Jew, ask me for a drink since I'm a Samaritan woman? So what is the, what is the expectation that a Samaritan should have from a Jew? Silence. Silence, ignore, they're not there, they're less than a Jew. And um, so she's a little surprised even by what uh, Jesus does. Um, what, what are some, maybe some of the other reasons that maybe this would have been unusual? Notice where she is, what time it is, and where is Jesus? At the same place, at the same time. So, you know, some of this, I, I think, starts to kind of play in there just the time of day that he's there. I know that he's on a journey but it just so happens he's kind of there also maybe trying to avoid the crowd. I don't know. You know, but, um, you know, but for them to be talking is, is very unusual. And she uh, says that in verse 9. And then it says in the parenthetical statement, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. They just don't, they don't deal with them. I don't want no water from you. I don't want food from you. I would rather starve. I'd rather thirst to death than to be talking to a Samaritan. All right, so let's move on down. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said to her, if you only knew. If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. And so Jesus says in verse 10, Jesus tells the woman he could give her a gift if she understood who it is that she's actually talking to. What's the gift? And Jesus kind of goes into this discussion a little later also in there. Living water. Living water. And if you um, look at this, um, this idea of living water, it's mentioned a couple of times, uh, mostly in the New Testament uh, it, it is mentioned. But the other places that it's mentioned is, uh, if you will, turn to um, uh, John chapter 7 and verse 38 he mentions this again and he mentions this almost in the same context he does, does her if you knew who you were talking to or you believed in who you were talking to you'd have living water and then in John chapter 7 and verse 38 whoever believes in me as, as the scriptures has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the Spirit whom uh, those who had believed in him were to receive, for as of yet the Spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So uh, again we see this idea of uh, living water uh, being mentioned. And in Jeremiah chapter 2, in verse uh, 13, this is kind of the only place that I really kind of found uh, this idea of living water in there. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And so in this idea of what Jeremiah says about this living water, who is it that is the living water in Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13? Maybe I'll flip there and read it a little bit too fast. Jeremiah 2 and verse 13. In this, it's God that is the living water. Yeah, be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils, for they have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. And so... God is attributed to being the living waters that they have forsaken. 
So when he makes this statement to her that if you knew who you, it is that, you could have, that you're speaking to and that he could have given you a gift of God and you would have asked of him and he would have given you the living water. In other words, pointed you where? Jesus. To, to where God is. And, you know, and we're going to kind of continue on in this conversation. So this idea of living water, again, is the only uh, Old Testament scripture that I know of. That is there in uh, Jeremiah chapter 2 and verse 13. But there's others uh, in, um, in the, the New Testament as well. Any question or comment? I got, I'd always understood that the prophet Jeremiah had prophesied about those coming to see uh, water, and it doesn't necessarily say specifically say living water, but prophesying that, that there would be those who would come seeking waters of salvation, and also that there was a couple chapters in Jeremiah that talk about that, but also in, in uh, Isaiah 12, 3, it talks about the wells of salvation prophesying, I think referring to Christ, but there's several times in Isaiah that he prophesies you know, the water about water. Yeah, water's kind of, that water kind of shows up all through uh, the, the Old Testament, the word water does, and you know, and there, I think that's a good word study in itself. Um, but, you know, I wanted to kind of find the connective tissue here because as we started in John chapter 3, um, and there's this discussion about the Spirit and the water, the water and the Spirit, and then we are moving into this idea of the baptism um, of John and then the baptism that uh, Jesus' disciples were doing. And now here we are talking about uh, waters from this well. And Jesus says, you know, we're talking about the living waters now. So uh, John is kind of, I, I don't think that's by mistake. I think it's certainly by design that this conversation has a lot to do with water and we'll see here very shortly about truth and spirit also. And so we're still kind of talking about that idea of water and spirit and truth and light. And, you know, so this conversation, I think, is related to um, the conversation that they were having uh, that Jesus had with um, Nicodemus as well. Anybody agree, disagree? I think that's right. Is that, you know, in the Old Testament, they're prophesying waters and food that are going to sustain the soul for you know to eternity, and that's what Jesus is, is fulfilling, and that's what he's telling this this lady here. But that's that's exactly what was forecasted in, in Isaiah and Jeremiah. Yeah, and uh, other places that is mentioned um, is uh, mostly in John chapter um, in in the book of John. You have John chapter four and verse twelve. Um, in uh, verse um, 11, and then John 7, 37, uh, rivers of living water on the last day of the feast. There was a great day that Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me for drink. Um, and then in John chapter, or I'm sorry, in Revelation chapter 7, in verse 17, it's mentioned again, for the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd, and he will guide them to springs of living water. So this idea of living water or water in general just continues to show up through the scriptures and again I think it's a good word study uh, and I think that we see a continuation here in John chapter 3 on into John chapter 4. Go ahead Nancy. Well I, in, in this chapter even later on Jesus is talking about the soul mm -hmm. and its needs not the physical right. and its needs. He starts the comparative right there and later on he talks about Food. Right. So, yeah, I definitely, he's trying to lead into what is the most important thing. Yeah. Um, and we'll see. I think she kind of takes it to heart also. So, because her reaction to all of this of what's going on, which we're going to read here very shortly, um, we'll see that I think she gets it. She's understanding exactly what Jesus is saying here uh, as she uh, gains more information. So, let's move on down. Uh, she says in verse 11, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Um, where do you get this living water? So her connection to this living water is the water in the well. And she's not quite understanding exactly what he's saying. And so, well, the water's deep. You don't have anything to draw from. 
So how are you going to get this living water that you're speaking of? And then in verse uh, uh, 12, uh, she makes this statement, You are not greater than our father Jacob, are you, who gave us the well and drank of it himself and his sons and his cattle. And then Jesus kind of gives her some more information. Anybody who drinks of that water and that well, what's going to happen to them? Again. They're going to be thirsty again. But if you drink of the water I'm willing to give you, you will never be thirsty again. You're going to have eternal life. In, um, in verse uh, 14, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him shall never thirst, but the water I will give him will become in him a well of water springing up to eternity. So what he's saying is this that if you continue to draw out of this well, you're going to continue to be thirsty. You're going to come out here every day at noon and you're going to continue to, to drink of this because it is a physical thing and you are trying to nourish your, your uh, physical body. And as Nancy pointed out, now we're going to try to turn um, and get her to think about something that's spiritual. However, if you uh, drink of the water I'm willing to give you, and that is the living water, you will never thirst again. And as a matter of fact, you are going to become the well in which this water kind of comes out of. Go ahead, Clint. I think it's important to notice some of the wording. And, and a lot of times when we talk about rivers or streams, you know, a natural question is, what's the source? Right? That, that's essentially what she's asking. Right. How, do, how do you get this living water? You know, she, yeah. she makes that es es essential question. And Jesus answers her by saying, you're going to be thirsty again if you have this physical, but the source, I'm going to give you. Right. Right? God's going to give you. Even your verse in Jeremiah. It said that it was a fountain of the living water. That's, the fountain is the source. Where does the living water come from? The fountain. Right. And notice where he says it's going to come from. And, and I'm glad that you pointed that out. You know, um, we'll be, um, in verse 14, but the water that I will give him will become in him a well. And so as you pointed out, it's like giving the, 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 the whole fountain where it actually comes from, from, the, from within. And so we're starting to see a pretty deep conversation starting to have here. No pun intended, I know we're standing by a well. But, you know, it is becoming a pretty deep conversation here that they're having because of this um, idea of trying to move from the physical into the spiritual. Now, remember the conversation that was happening with Nicodemus. Nicodemus is looking for what type of kingdom? A physical kingdom. However, Jesus says it's not like that at all. You're not born into this kingdom by flesh. You are born into the kingdom by the spirit. And so even then, you have this great leader or teacher of Israel, and he's having to explain this to. And now he's standing here at this Samaritan woman, and he's explaining the exact same thing. So this message that's being shared is for all walks of life from the most educated to the least educated. And um, we see that this woman uh, says to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty nor come all the way out here to draw. So she's still not, kinda, not quite getting it. And, but she wants this water so she's never thirsty again because she don't want to come out there at midday and all that kind of stuff and everything that comes along with it. So she's still kind of thinking about what? Physical water. Physical water. She's thinking that I won't have to come to this well anymore. And, um, and now he says to her, go call your husband and come here. Now, in this verse, this is Jesus kind of doing what with her? I'm sorry, what? Testing her? Okay. <clears throat> Go ahead, Paul. He said that in order to reveal to her who he is. Yeah, I, yeah, I think it is a test. 
um, to see you know, whether or not she's going to believe, but he's going to reveal exactly who he is. He knows all about her, and this sets up a whole new conversation, but in her reaction to this, what do we see, and let's go ahead and read her reaction to this, and she says, uh, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you have correctly said you have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one whom you now have is not your husband. This you have said truly. The woman said to him, what? I perceive that you are a prophet. So what was this comment even designed to do for her? Well, it's letting her acknowledge her real truth about who she is. And... <clears throat> By her being truthful, it opens the door for him to say to her, yes, I know that you're saying the truth, and it, it allows it to go continue. Right. He is trying to take her from still her, her um, initial, before he makes this statement, her initial thing is, give me this water so that I may do what? Don't have to come out here anymore. Right. So she's not quite getting it, so he lays this down, knowing kind of where it's going to lead to, the conversation where it's going to lead to, and now the light's about to go come on for her. And remember who Jesus is. She is living in a world of darkness, a world of sin. She's obviously ashamed of it. She's coming out in midday, if that is her reasoning, and we'll, I'm kind of going on the angle that she is coming out there at midday because she's ashamed of it. And now Jesus is kind of bringing the light to the darkness. Remember in John chapter 1 what the light does and what happens with the darkness. Chases it away. Chases it away. The darkness, uh, those who were of darkness kind of come to the light. Some will not. Some will. Uh, those who believe will. And so that's exactly what's going on here and you can see how he's progressing in his um, taking her from where she currently is to where he wants her to be and what he wants her to understand. And so, you know, um, she uh, has this conversation about these five husbands that she had, and he says, as a matter of fact, the one you're with now, he ain't your husband. I don't know who he is. He just, he's not her husband. She's not married to him. And then she makes this statement, sir, I perceive you are a prophet. And then she's going to talk about the type of worship that her fathers and her share, or the commonality that they would have in their thinking of who God is and how he ought to be worshipped. And he, she says, uh, our fathers in this mountain, <clears throat> worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. So she knows he's kind of a prophet or something special about him, so she's kind of opening up herself because now we're kind of shifting a little bit of the conversation and she sees he's a prophet, which means he's from what? Jerusalem. Well, he's from God, is what she's initially saying there. I perceive you're a prophet. So you're from God. Right. Now she, her conversation turns to what? Spiritual. Spiritual things. See how Jesus did that? Mm -hmm. So knowing about a person and getting to know a person is very important. Now, of course, the Lord has it. He knew. So, but we have to get to know people also and kind of where they are, where they need to be, and, and learn how to do exactly what's going on here, and that is getting people talk about spiritual things. Because now she's talking about how she worships, how they worship, and we see that she has some at least understanding that there is a difference between what she does and what Jesus and his crew does, or you people. Any question? Comment? All right, let's move on. So, um, our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people say that in Jerusalem is a place where men ought to worship. And then Jesus answers her and says, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. And so, what's he talking about here that there's this hour to come? talking about the gospel age when the kingdom is established. Correct. Uh, we're not, you don't have to go to Jerusalem to worship God now. 
And this Samaritan woman living in this age that we live in now would not have to go to where that mountain was to worship God. Instead, all those old things have been fulfilled. They're in the past, and the new has now been made. And um, so and I know that's a little bit later in our story of the gospel, but that's kind of what he's pointing her towards right now. And he even goes on to say, Jesus said to her, well, believe me, there's an hour coming when it's not even in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. In verse 22, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. Now, it does not say that all Jews are saved. But this lineage of this promise that was made to Abraham, and we started this study over a year ago about those three promises to Abraham and how the Bible starts to shift focus into those three promises. You got the land promise. What other promise? The seed promise and the promise of the nation also. And that seed promise is coming to pass right here and we see him talking about that. Salvation is from the Jews. In other words, the lineage goes through, and that's the way that God chose to bring about the Savior of mankind. And he says, you know, that's, you, you worship what you don't know, because they don't have the scriptures like the way the Jews do. But the Jews do worship the way that they uh, know that they are worshiping, and, um, and is it the correct way. Go ahead. What he's done here in this conversation, he's exposed moral sin yep. in her life, and now he's exposed doctrinal sin. So he's, he's, it gives us a great pattern. When there are things that we know about people, it's totally appropriate to address those issues because that's how you get to their heart. That's how you prick their heart, as Acts 2 did. The, you know, Peter pricked their hearts until they come to recognition of their sin and acknowledgement of it, they're never going to go anywhere. Right. But the way he and he he does it with her husband very gently. Yeah, you don't have a husband, I know that. That five when you were that you know he addressed it in a very gentle way with this woman, but then he just very plainly states, You're wrong about the worship. Right. It's of the Jews. It's not of the Samaritans, which was the Samaritans' claim. So he just very plainly states that, but he's putting it in a way um, that is opening that door for her to have that broader understanding about, look, it's, it's not about here or there. It's about who's really committed to the Lord. Yeah, and that, that conversation continues on also about who's committed to the Lord and the type of worshiper that God wants because that's really what it is. As you pointed out, it's not about the mountain. It's not about Jerusalem. It's about the type of person that worships God. And he goes on uh, into that. Um, so let's, let's continue on. And he says, uh, and it's a good point that he does point out the error that she's in. And, but let me talk to you more about this. In verse, um, verse 23, but an hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth for such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. There is a lot stated in there because, again, he's saying it's not about the place that you go um, that in the, in the future state that's going to be very important. But the important part is the type of person that you are. And it even says those types of worshipers, God does what? See. He seeks. God is looking for people like this. And that to me is a very great comfort that we ought to have that God is seeking. You know, and we, we talk about the parable of the, of the 99 and the 1 and the shepherd goes out and what is he doing for the 1? He's seeking for the 1. And, you know, what we see in the idea of the Jews is God doesn't seek this. I mean, God seeks what? according to the Jew, to be, um, to be obeyed by the tithing of the mint and the cumin and all that kind of stuff. And that is not what God expects at all. What God expects, and he plainly says it here, an hour is coming and now is. 
when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. So what do we know about spirit and truth? Because he mentions it again in the very next verse. It says God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So those two words kind of commingled together. What is he talking about here? What two things must be present in the worshiper of God? What is God looking for whenever, he, whenever he's looking for a worshiper? Well, I guess he's looking for someone who's worshiping him according to the truth, mm -hmm. which means there's a false worship because there's a true worship. He's also looking for spiritual worship, not physical worship. So that was that spiritual worship is something new, but that means something for us today. God wants true worship in spirit, not false worship in the physical, which is what most people do today, unfortunately. Right. It's, a, it's very revealing to, to the Jews, but also to us, what truth it is. Correct. And, you know, the thing is, both of them have to be present. You cannot go about your life making check marks and thinking, I've got it, because I'm doing what this says. There has to be a spirit about you that this is the reason as to why you're doing it. And, you know, why are we worshiping God? Why do you worship God? Why do you want to worship God. You know, who, who is this man, Jesus, to you? What does he mean to you? These things were written so that you may believe. So what are we supposed to believe about him? Well, we know that he's the light and the light, and he also is called the word. And the word is what? Absolute truth. And so that's what we ought to worship is absolute uh, truth, the word um, with, with Christ in it. Um, in, with what Christ reveals to us, and then also having that spirit or that heart that God is looking for, a soft heart. And we also see in many of the parables, of course, there's, we don't see any in John, but some of the parables, uh, the one that kind of stands out is the parable of the sower. And it talks about the different heart and where the soils are and what type of soil that, we're having, that you're supposed to have. That's the type of spirit that you should have is one in which God can grow uh, his fruit in. Go ahead. It's a good example of, of these two <clears throat> being imbalanced on both sides of it in the book of Revelation. You have Ephesus that they attested those who said they were apostles and found them not to be. They were on the truth, but it says you left your first love. They, they lost the motivation, the reason why are we doing this? Because we're committed to Christ is what they had lost. And then Sardis, they had a name, a reputation that they were aligned. He said, you're dead. You got the enthusiasm. Wonderful, great. But you're dead. Right. So there, there's those two extremes. We have to have both of those in place. So it, it is an issue of, yeah, there are commandments we keep. And we, we need to be very conscious about that. But when we get to the point that the commandment in and of itself becomes the ruling thing versus us committed to Christ and we keep them because we're under the end. That's when we start running into a problem. That's a very good, very good point because uh, having that balance is really the key to everything that you have in your life but uh, to this worship because an imbalance of the spirit and I've got the right attitude and everything else but you don't have the truth, well what good is that? And if you have the truth, but yet you don't have the correct attitude about it, well, what good is that? It takes both. Uh, it's a very good uh, illustration there uh, in Revelation that you bring out. Um, all right, so an hour is coming, or on verse 24, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship, must worship him in spirit and in truth. This, to me, is a pretty shocking revelation. In verse 25, the woman said, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called as Christ, who is called Christ, when that one comes, he will declare all things to us. So she understands something about the Messiah, something about the Christ, and she's looking forward to that. This next statement by Jesus, Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. He just lays it out there, I am the Messiah. I am the Christ. I'm the one that you're looking for. And so, again, just a very uh, shocking truth here that he says. 
in this revelation that he kind of gives her, you can see now that she is already talking about spiritual things, and so she's willing to accept this, um, this conversation or who this man is. Because the very next verse says, at, at this point his disciples came and they were amazed that he had been speaking with the woman, yet no one said, why do you seek or why do you speak with her? Um, what do you seek or why do you speak with her? So the woman left her water pot and went to the city and said to the men, come and see a man who told me all things that I have done. This uh, is not the Christ, is it? They went out of the city and were coming to him. Now the disciples, remember they were out shopping, we didn't forget that. So they get back from the grocery store and they've got their food and they see this conversation kind of happening. Now, Melinda and I were having this conversation and I asked the question, what is significant about the woman leaving her water jar at the wall or at the, at the well? And I think it's significant because I, I don't know if I were writing this, if I would have said, and at that point she left her water, her jar and then went run into the city. It could show excitement I think it shows a little bit more. And that is, what was the reason that she came to that well? She was looking for the physical water. She was looking for physical water to put in that jar and take home. And something has happened, a conversation has happened, that that means absolutely nothing now. And she has now said, in this revelation that he gives her, is I, I who speak to you am he, I, I think really excites her, and she knows exactly, the, as I said, the light kind of goes on for her in this idea of what living water is, of this spring of, of waters coming up from her, this idea that she would never thirst again. She leaves that water pot right where it is, and she goes and talks to all of these uh, other men and says, you know, this guy told me everything about me. Now, why would her, her words or her accounting of this, why would it make such an impact on them? Because of who she is and how her life is. And now all of a sudden she's speaking, she even says, is this not the Christ? Right. She's had a whole new revelation and she's sharing it. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to share Christ yeah. to others so that they would want to come, and that's what she's doing. Yeah, her, uh, you know, her life's a mess, obviously. And, you know, she's coming up and saying, you got to come meet this guy. Mm -hmm. I think I found him, the one that we've been waiting for that's going to declare all things. And he declared all things about me. So her um, experience with him is that he is exactly who he says he is. And so... They come, they come out, meanwhile the disciples were urging him, Rabbi, eat, and he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. And the disciples were asking each other, did you bring him food? I don't remember bringing him any, anything. And uh, Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me to accomplish his work. And so we have this idea again that, you know, man does not live by bread alone, but by what? by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so we see this uh, coming here. He's speaking about this. He is doing the will of him who sent, um, who sent Christ. And then, um, and then he makes this statement about, and I'm going to try to rush through this because we've got uh, another story here we've got to read. Um, but he starts talking about this idea of whenever you walk into... Um, and to someone else's uh, labor, and you're the harvester, you have to understand that the harvest is plenty. And so he's teaching them a lesson also that they'll have to apply later on whenever they start to evangelize the world. Um, there are four months, and yet comes the harbor. Behold, I, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white for harvest. In other words, those who have sown, it's already done and over with, now we're walking into the harvest. So who are the sowers that you think he's talking about? One of them would be John. Yeah, I think John is probably one of them. Probably the prophets, their work, uh, all the things that we see in the Old Testament, you know, all those writings and everything. That all has kind of taken root, and now it's time to send laborers into the harvest. Um, 
And then he says in verse 37, for in this case, what we're talking about, the saying is true, one sows and another reaps. I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. So you're now the harvesters, you're the, the reapers, you're, you're the ones that's going to do some of the work now also based upon a foundation that was built upon prophecy and those prophets and, those, um, and the law. All right, so from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of what? Because of what she says, because of, um, because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all things that I have done. So the Samaritans come to Jesus and they start talking to him. And obviously some conversations going on there. We don't really know what the conversation is. But it says in verse 41, or verse 40, um, so the Samaritans came to Jesus. They were asking him to stay there. And he stayed there two days. Now remember he was traveling from somewhere to get somewhere. And I guess those people can kind of wait because there's a harvest right here. And so... We have this uh, idea or this, um, this um, city wanting to say, stay here. And so they, they decide, he decides to stay for two days. And in verse 41, more believed because of his word. And they were saying to the woman, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard ourselves and know that this one indeed is the Savior of the world. So it's no longer just about what she says, it's about what? About what? They're hearing. What they hear. <coughs> Any miracles being performed here? Nope. Does it say that there is? It's just they listened to what she had to say, she kind of pointed them to, uh, she, she pointed them to him, and now it is because of what he says that they now believe. Now after two days, he went from there into Galilee, for Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans received him, having seen all the things that he did in Jerusalem at the feast, for they themselves also went to the feast. Therefore he came into Cana, remember where Cana was and what happened there, um, of Galilee, where he had made the water into wine, there was a royal fisher who was, whose son was sick at Capernaum. Uh, Capernaum. Uh, when he heard that Jesus had come out of Judea into Galilee, he probably thought, man, that took him a long time. But we see the work that Jesus was doing, and we also see what Jesus says about doing the work of God, that that's enough to sustain you. <coughs> and we also see... In verse 47, when, the, when he had heard Jesus come out of Judea, to, he went and imploring him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. In verse 48, Jesus makes this statement. Now remember, he's given them the water into wine already. And then in verse 48, Jesus says to him what? Unless you see signs and wonders. Unless you see signs and wonders, you, you will not believe. And so, what was the experience that he's had with the Samaritans versus the, Samar the, the experience that he's having now with Jews? They're more believing. What? They're a harder bunch to, to kind of go with. They're, yeah, they're, they're, they, they need signs and wonders, whereas the Samaritans hear truth and they recognize it as truth. And then he goes on to say, um, in verse 48, unless you people see signs and wonders, you simply will not believe. The royal official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. And then Jesus says, Just go, your son lives. The man believed that the word of Jesus spoke to him and started off. And then we see this uh, where he says, while he was going down, his slaves met him, and they said, What about his son? He's okay. He's good. And then he inquires of them, because, you know, that's not enough as what he asked for, but he inquires of them about what time did that happen. And what did they say? About the seventh hour. About the seventh hour. 
And then the father, uh, in verse 53, the father knew that it was the hour which Jesus said to him, your son lives, and he, he himself believed in his whole household. So exactly what Jesus said kind of comes to pass here, and that is unless there are signs and wonders happening uh, in front of the Jews, uh, or at least this guy, um, he's just not going to believe. And so does he give him his sign, his wonder? Yes. He does. So there's no excuse. Right. And he goes on about an inquiry. Well, about what time was it? And he says, well, it was about seventh hour. And he says, well, that was the seventh hour was whenever I was with Jesus and he said this. And then it says in verse 54, this is again a second sign that Jesus performed when he had come out of Judea to Galilee. And so the contrast that we're starting to see here and we're going to start seeing even a, a darker contrast start to happen between um, people who should not know Jesus. They are much more receptive to Jesus, whereas the people who should know Jesus are much more aloof from him. And I think that's what you'll continue to see throughout the book as well. And we are out of time. Any question, comment, closing thoughts? That particular thought starts at 19 and then 25 eliminates uh, for, the, for the Gentile Jesus came to correct yes you know and you're exactly right he comes you know and what he says in verse um, what's being stated by those Jews or by those Samaritans in verse 42 um, he is the savior of the world um, that is a correct statement that I don't think the Jews really understood. He's the Savior of the world. All right, anything else? Thank you.